we will talk about the spinal cord which is a part of your central nervous system brain and spinal cord those are two parts of the central nervous system right first we will see the anatomy of the spinal cord we will see the length diameter we will see external features if you look the spinal cord from outside how it looks like we will see the location where it is located in the body so anatomy of the spinal cord then we will see the functions of the spinal cord then we will talk about the spinal nerves from both sides of the spinal cord you know that 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise right in last lecture I mentioned how many cranial nerves from the brain 12 pairs spinal nerves 31 pairs right so we'll see how those spinal nerves are formed then we'll talk about the tracts inside the spinal cord inside the spinal cord you have the bundle of fibers those are called the tracts bundle of fibers some bundles are taking the signal upwards those are called the ascending tracts some bundles taking the signal downwards those are called what descending tracts so two types of tracts ascending those tracks take the signal towards the brain, to the brain, and descending away from the brain. Make sense? Now you tell me from your last lecture. Those tracks are taking signal to the brain. Those are sensory or motor. What do you think? Sensory. Because sensory signal go to the brain, right? Those are taking the signal downwards. Those are motor taking out. So you have ascending or sensory and descending or motor tracks where right? in the spinal cord so we'll see those tracks then we'll talk about the relay of sensory and motor signals why relay is important you see if I touch my fingertip that touch signal sensory signal goes to the brain right from my fingertip to my brain is far away so one neuron cannot take that signal that far so that's why there are relay stations so one neuron will give the signal to another neuron that will take it to certain you know distance then another one will take and will take it to the brain so that's why you have the relays or relay stations along the pathway so we will see that where the relay occurs first the location of the spinal cord spinal cord is located inside the vertebral column inside the spine you all know that so your spinal cord is located beside the vertebral column you have the vertebral canal inside the vertebral column and through that canal the spinal cord passes the upper end of the spinal cord is here that means at the foramen magnum you must remember foramen magnum here that's the upper end and lower end ends at lumbar 1 so this is lumbar 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1 most of the cases lower end of the spinal cord ends here sometime it goes to L2, lumbar 2 but will not go below that so in this area you don't have any spinal cord then see that most of the time ends here, sometimes here. 
So that's the lower ten. The length is about eighteen inches. That means forty-five centimeter, and the width is half inch or fourteen millimeter. Functions two-way communication. You remember I said ascending and descending tracks are inside the spinal cord, right? So ascending tracks carry sensory signal, descending tracks carry motor signal. So both way communication, right? So that's the function of the spinal cord. Protection. Your spinal cord is a very delicate and important organ. So like your brain your spinal cord is also heavily protected the number of structures are protecting the spinal cord first <coughs> the bone which bones vertebrae because we know that spinal cord is inside the vertebral column right so vertebrae are the bones then next to the bone you have fats in epidural space around your spinal cord like your brain you have three meninges outer dura middle arachnoid innermost pa mater so those three are also present around the spinal cord so above the dura mater that space is the epidural space right and in that space you have fats fat tissue adipose tissue but remember there is no epidural fat in the brain there is no fat around the brain so this protection is only present in the spinal cord epidural fat then you have the dura mater which is the toughest meninges outermost and thickest and then you have the arachnoid mater the middle meninges and innermost one which covers the spinal cord attached to the spinal cord that is the pa mater so those are exactly same as your brain you have cerebral spinal fluid in sub arachnoid space you know that sub arachnoid space contains the cerebral spinal fluid right you remember last class i mentioned so those are the protections for your spinal cord now your brain also has those protections but here you see an extra protection that is the epidural fat which is not present around the brain if you see the spinal cord from outside you will see the number of structures so in two areas you will see the spinal cord gets wider expanded in the cervical area that means in this area and in lumbar area here so in cervical and lumbar in these two areas the spinal cord gets wider or expanded so two 
expansions. And now, if you see the lower end of the spinal cord, it is conical shaped, cone shaped, lower end. And this cone shaped part is called <coughs> conus medullaris. Conus medullaris. And you know that innermost meninges, which is the PA matter, covers the spinal cord attached to the surface of the spinal cord. So, this is the PA matter. attached to the outer surface of the spinal cord. Now what happens, the diameter continues like this and forms a cord-like, thin cord-like structure. This is called phylum terminale. This cord-like extension that extends down from the lower end of the conus medullaris, the pointed end of the conus medullaris, that is the phylum terminale. Okay. Phylum terminal. And this cord, which is formed by PA matter, goes down and gets attached to the tailbone coccyx. So, this is the coccyx. So, basically the lower end of the spinal cord is tied to the coccyx by phylum terminally. So, the lower end cannot move like this. Make sense? Tying the lower end to the bone coccyx. Now, from the PA matter, also ligaments <coughs> arise. These are ligaments arise from the PA matter like this on both sides and get attached to the dura matter. Dura matter is the outermost meninges, you know, which is very thick and tough. So, this is dura. And this is PA, and from PA matter, these ligaments arise and get attached to the dura matter. And these ligaments are called denticulate ligament. So, these ligaments are also holding the spinal cord in right place and won't allow the spinal cord to move sideways. So, lower end is tied to the coccyx by phylum terminally. Both sides are tied to the dura mater by denticulate ligaments. Right? So, it's like I am tying you to the walls from both sides as well as from the legs to the ground. So, you won't be able to move. So, spinal cord will not be able to move around, right? So, that's uh, the denticulate ligament. Now, from the conus medullaris, you can see this conical shaped part. Many nerve roots arise like this bunch of nerve roots and this bunch of nerve roots is called cordae equine cordae equine so cordae equine is a bundle of nerve roots or bunch of
not root. Called a equine. That means horse tail, tail of the horse. It looks like the tail of the horse. Okay. Have you seen horse tail? It's a bunch of not roots. So those are um, the things you should be able to see from outside. Here you see uh, two enlargements or expansions, cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. Okay, and you see other structures here. Now, one thing: why these two areas are expanded or enlarged? The reason is you know. From your upper limbs, many nerves, big nerves, right, enter into the spinal cord. So, in which part of the spinal cord? Cervical part. So, that's why to receive the input from those nerves, your upper limbs, you need more neurons there. So, that's why that area is what? Expand. Sense? From your lower limbs, legs, Many nerves go to the spinal cord. Which area of the spinal cord receive, receives this area? So that's why this area is expanded. So there are two expansions or enlargements to receive the nerves from the upper and lower limbs. Make sense, right? Uh, A procedure to collect the cerebrospinal fluid. You must remember cerebrospinal fluid circulates in subarachnoid space, right? Around your brain and the spinal cord as well as inside the ventricles. So, if any where in your central nervous system, it could be in the brain or the spinal cord, any internal hemorrhage or bleeding occurs. Difficult to see, right? So, if you collect the cerebrospinal fluid and examine the cerebrospinal fluid, it can be detected easily because when bleeding occurs, you know, fluid is circulating throughout the central nervous system, right? So, the blood cells or trace of blood could be found in the cerebrospinal fluid because that fluid is circulating. And that's why it is important that we collect the cerebrospinal fluid and examine it. That is one. Another is if any infection occurs anywhere in the brain, meningitis or encephalitis, anything, the microorganisms will spread, right, in the body fluid. So, if you collect cerebrospinal fluid from anywhere, you should be able to see the microorganism. So, you can do the culture and see if that microorganism is present, right? And what kind of microorganism is that? Easy. So, we need to get the cerebrospinal fluid. But the problem is, if you try to get the cerebrospinal fluid from here, insert needle, that will cause damage to your brain, right? If you do from here, that will destroy your spinal cord, the chance of injury is there, right? So, that's why we collect the cerebrospinal fluid from the lower lumbar area because you know spinal cord ends there at lumbar 1 or lumbar 2, but not below that. So, we prefer lumbar 3, 4, 5, there is no spinal cord, but you have what? You see here, this is lumbar 1, for example, the lower end of the spinal cord at lumbar 1. Now, the dura mater continues like this. So, you have a lot of fluid here in subarachnoid space, arachnoid matter. So, you have fluid here. So, we will insert the needle and draw the fluid from there. Makes sense, right? No spinal cord, but you have the arachnoid matter, subarachnoid space, dura mater and fluid there. So, what we do, we ask the patient to lie down sideways on the bed and curve the upper part of the body 
move the upper part of the body, bend the upper part of the body forward, like this, okay? So if you do that, you see what happens. In the back, <coughs> in between the spinous processes, you have openings. See that? Spinal cord is here. So when you bend your body like this, these openings get bigger, open wider. So you can easily feel the spines and insert the needle. So this area gets bigger like this. So you can collect the cerebral spinal fluid from the lower lumbar area. And that procedure is called lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture. Okay. Formation of the spinal nerves from the spinal cord, 31 pairs of spinal nerves arise. And now, if I See, the section of the spinal cord, like this is the spinal cord. If I just take a cross section here, you know from both sides you have 31 pairs of the spinal nerve, like this. If I just take a cross section here, what I will see, I will see a part of the spinal cord and two spinal nerves attached to that. So let's see this part. So. I am taking only this part, that means you have a slice of spinal segment of spinal cord and one pair of nerves. So now I am looking from the top. So this is the spinal cord. In the center, you have central canal. You know, several spinal fluid passes through that. And in the spinal cord, you have gray matter in the center. So this part is the gray matter, like butterfly. This butterfly-like part is the gray matter. And outer part is the white matter. Gray spelling G R A Y or E Y both are correct. <coughs> so this part is the gray matter, this outer area is the white matter. Now in each half of the spinal cord in the gray matter you have three horns, horn like structures. You know horn, right? Horns. So three. Horns. This is the front, this is the back of the body. So this horn is called the ventral horn because front, ventral horn. This horn is called dorsal horn and this one lateral so in each half of gray matter how many horns you have three ventral dorsal lateral you already know why gray matter is gray because you have the cell bodies of neurons remember that nasal granules inside so in the gray matter you have the cell bodies in white matter you have myelinated fibers in the white matter. So we are talking about the gray matter. So you have neurons there, cell bodies. So in ventral heart, you have the cell bodies of modern neurons. So 
uh, the cell bodies of modern neurons in the ventral horn. In the dorsal horn, you have the cell bodies of sensory neurons. sensory neurons. So two different types of neurons. Modern in ventral horn, sensory in dorsal horn. In lateral horn, you have another type of neurons. Those are autonomic, sympathetic. So in the lateral horn, Horn contains contain three different types of neurons. The round structure, which is outside of the spinal cord, this is called dorsal root ganglion. Ganglion is a round structure outside of the central nervous system. So this is central nervous system, spinal cord. Outside of that, this round structure, that's why it is the ganglion. And ganglion contains the cell bodies. So, these are all sensory neurons, right? Sensory because sensory signal uh, is received by these neurons. And then, from there, these neurons <coughs> send signal to the dorsal horn. These are also sensory neurons. These are sensory neurons because the signal is sensory signal. So from here, the axons of these neurons will take the signal there. And then from there, the signal will go to the ventral part where you have the modern neurons. There are interneurons here. Those are small neurons. Take the signal from here to so from here, the signal will come here. And now, these are modern neurons. The modern neurons send signal to the muscle for contraction. So long axons from these neurons. There is no ganglion here. So the axons are long and going to the muscle. This is A. So, the motor neurons will send signal to the muscles here for contraction. So, now uh, one thing happens before they go to the muscle. These two bundles of fibers, before going to the body, what happens? They don't directly go there. They join together. So what happens? These fibers get together like this. Join together here. And then they go to the body wall like this. So these two bundles joined together to form one bundle and this is the spinal nerve, this part, spinal nerve and this bundle and this bundle, this sensory bundle is called the dorsal root, all these are dorsal because in the back. Dorsal root. Root is the bundle of fibers. And this bundle is called the ventral root. Okay. So dorsal root 
contains sensory fibers, pinch of root contains what kind of fibers? Motor fibers. Make sense? And now you see, if I ask you, the dorsal root transmits signal, sensory signal, in which direction? You know now, because from the skin, the sensory signal is going like this. So, this way. The signal is going towards the spinal cord, to the sensory nerve. So, dorsal root carries signal towards the spinal cord. Make sense? And ventral root sends signal to the muscles. So, the signal goes that way. So, in opposite direction. Sensory signal from the skin goes to the spinal cord and motor signal from the spinal cord goes to the muscle, to do the interaction. But those two roots unite here, meet here, to form one what? Spinal nerve, one bundle, that is the spinal nerve. Now, if I ask you a simple question, in dorsal root, what kind of fibers you have? Sensory or motor? Sensory. sensory. In ventral root, motor. And the signal? in opposite direction, right? Dorsal root takes the signal to the spinal cord, ventral root take, takes the signal away from the spinal cord, out. Now, if I ask you the spinal cord, you have which kind of fibers? Sensory or motor or both? Spinal nerve. Spinal yeah, spinal nerve, you have what? Both. both, right? Because sensory and motor are bundled together there. So inside the spinal cord, you have both. You remember in last lecture I said, spinal nerves are what kind of nerves? Mixed, Mixed now. Okay. His, his memory is better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned um, spinal nerves are mixed type nerves because they have both sensory and motor fibers. Okay. Now, uh, that's how the spinal nerve is formed. So this this picture is important, so you need to remember. So there are three horns in gray matter. And in dorsal root, there is a ganglion that contains the sensory neurons. So, <coughs> white matter, the outer part of the spinal cord. Why white matter is white? Because you have myelinated axons. Many. That's why the outer part is white. Now, I mentioned that Inside the spinal cord, in the white matter, some myelinated fibers bundle and form tracts. Bundle of fibers are called tracts. So you see, in this picture, in the outer white matter, there are bundles of axons or fibers. Those are called the tracts. And Two types of tracts are present, you must remember, ascending and descending. Ascending are what kind of tracts? Sensory or motor? Sensory. sensory. And descending are motor. So, that's why you see two different colors here. They have shown sensory or ascending and motor or descending tracts. Ascending tracts are shown by blue color. And descending or motor by red. First, we will talk about few ascending tracks, then few motor tracks. One thing before I mention the names, uh, if you remember one thing, that will be easy. Most of the ascending tracks or sensory tracks start with spino. Most of them start with what? Spino. For example, 
spinothalamic, spinocerebellar, right? Start with spinal because they are going from the spinal cord to the brain. That's why starting with spine. Most of the motor tracts end with spinal. Tectospinal, rubrospinal, corticospinal, vestibular spinal, okay? So ending with what? Spinal. So that is one easy way if I ask you this tract is sensory or ascending or motor or descending. You can tell. Okay? Exceptions you have to remember. Definitely. So there are two pairs of spinothalamic tracts, ascending tracts, ventral and lateral. So in each side you see ventral spinothalamic tract. In the left side you see in the bottom of left side ventral spinothalamic and lateral spinothalamic. In the other half you have same. Just know that spinothalamic tract these tracts carry pain temperature and fine touch signals pain temperature and fine touch touch soft touch <coughs> signal are transmitted by these tracks then you have spino cerebellar tracks those tracts are taking signal to the brain, but to which part of the brain? Cerebellum. You remember the cerebellum? And you must remember from last lecture, last week, uh, last, just last lecture, I mentioned cerebellum is responsible for balance and equilibrium, right? So, from the spinal cord, the signal goes to the cerebellum via the spinocerebellar tracts, and those tracts carry the body position signal from the muscles and joints because cerebellum needs those signal to maintain the balance right if cerebellum doesn't know then how it will maintain the balance very simple so your signal from the muscles and joints right uh, about your body position so cerebellum can get that signal right and help you to maintain the balance. Cere Spinocerebellar. In the back part, you see there are two tracts in each half. Fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Fasciculus gracilis medially and fasciculus cuneatus laterally. And just know that fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, those are mainly responsible for crude touch, deep pressure signal, crude touch signal. And there are other functions, just remember those cues, you are still, uh, you know, basic stuff, you should know, before you go further. Now, uh, the motor tracts, the red ones, the most powerful and important motor tracts are corticospinal. Corticospinal tracts. Those are also called pyramidal tracts. <coughs> so, corticospinal or pyramidal tracts. You remember in last lecture when I talked about the brain, you have central sulcus, and in front of the central sulcus, you have the gyrus, that is the primary motor cortex, precentral gyrus. So what happens, and in the back you have 
post central gyrus, which is primary somatosensory, and this is the central sulcus. So, this is the primary motor cortex. So, main area that controls the muscles. So, from here, the fibers arise and form the bundle that is the corticospinal. From the cortex, primary motor cortex to the spinal cord, cortical spinal. That is the motor movement. All skeletal muscle movements are controlled by this area through the cortical spinal or pyramidal tract. <coughs> Other uh, motor are vestibular spinal. This one adjust the head position. Just know the name rubrospinal, tectospinal, those are. Tectospinal uh, uh, controls the eye reflex, reflex of eye movement. So those are smaller uh, motor tracts. The main one is the cortical spinal, which is also known as pyramidal, that controls the skeletal muscles of the body. Okay. So those are the tracts, two types of tracts. Now we will see the relay along the sensory pathway. I told you that one neuron is not long enough to take the signal from the outer area of the body to the brain. That's why in few locations the relay occurs and you have already seen you must remember dorsal root ganglion inside the dorsal root ganglion you have the neurons sensory neurons so this is one set of neurons and then from here goes to the spinal cord and you have three horns must remember to the forget that first here you have sensory neurons in dorsal horn from here the signal goes there and then to the brain in the brain you have thalamus. So this is the thalamus. You have another set of neurons here. Another set of neurons, sensory neurons, because that thalamus is the major sensory relay station I mentioned in last class. Almost all sensory signals must go to the thalamus. So. This is thalamus, so this must be spinal thalamic tract. Just saying. So, receptors from the receptors, the signal is first taken to these neurons, sensory neurons in the dorsal root ganglion. So, these are the first order neurons. In sensory pathway, first order neurons. And then these are the second order neurons. Then in the thalamus, you have third order neurons. Then from the thalamus, if that sensory signal is pain touch temperature, will go to the post central gyrus. If visual, will go to the back. You know, visual cortex is here, will go there. So, respective cortices. But from the thalamus, the signal will go to the cortex, right? 
what kind of signal is that? If it is visual, will go there. Auditory will go here. Somatosensory will go there. So this is the last relay station before the signal goes to the cortex. So those are the three places. You have three groups of neurons. First order neurons, second order neurons, and third order neurons. Now one thing. If I touch my fingers here, the signal will go to the spinal cord, right? But if the signal, for example, I touch here or visual signal from the eye, it doesn't need to go to the spinal cord because it is so close to the brain, right? So from this part, the signal doesn't need to go to the spinal cord and come back. So the signal will go to the brain stem which is just above the spinal cord, right? Above the spinal cord, you have the brain stem. So, the signal will go to the brain stem, pons medulla, and then you have second order neurons there instead of in the spinal cord. From there, it will go to thalamus. Make sense? So, uh, that's only from the upper part of the body. But for most part of the body, uh, but the signal will be taken to the brain stem and then to the brain, most of the cases, except there are exceptions now. Uh, in case of affection, signal goes from here to the olfactory bulb. You remember the olfactory bulb? Yeah. There, you have the group of neurons there. It's a, like a ganglion, but in the central nervous system, we don't say ganglion, that is a bulb. So those are exceptions. From the eye, we'll go to optic chiasma, right? and you have the ganglion cells in the retina, retinal ganglion cells. So in this case, the ganglion cells are in the retina. So those are so directly those going. Palm, those couple will not go through the pons. But others, olfactory, those will go directly. But your taste signal will go to the brain step. Then will go to the brain. So uh, yeah, from this part, it's different. Couple of those will directly go, but ganglion cells are there. The question is where the ganglion cells in the retina or in the olfactory bulb? Uh, those. But uh, this is from most part of the body. <coughs> so here uh, you see in this picture uh, from the skin of your hand or foot, signal will go to dorsal root ganglion here and then from there to dorsal horn and from there let's see the next station is here this one is part in the brain thalamus the third group of neurons we have talked about this now that's the sensory or ascending pathway the motor pathway is rather simple. So we know this is the this is the central sulcus. Precentral gyrus is primary motor, and postcentral gyrus is what sensory, somatosensory. So these are somatosensory. So if I touch that signal will go to ganglion cells, dorsal root, dorsal horn uh, cells, then thalamus, then to the somatosensory here because that is touch. Now, motor pathway is simple. These neurons in the brain, these are called upper motor neurons. upper motor neurons in the brain. Most of the upper motor neurons are motor neurons are where in precentral gyrus because this is the primary motor cortex. From there, the signal, the axons will take the signal to ventral horn motor neurons. You already know in the ventral horn, you have the motor neurons. The signal 
from the upper motor neurons, we we'll go to the ventral horn neurons. So these neurons are called the lower motor neurons. So very simple. Upper motor neurons are in the brain, lower motor neurons are in the spinal cord. Which part of the spinal cord? In which horn? Ventral horn, right? Ventral horn. <coughs> so, two sets. And then from ventral horn, we will go higher. Follow. Everybody. Muscle, right? Muscle. Is it clear? Okay, so, along the sensory pathway, how many orders of neurons? Three. First order, second order, third order, right? You know the location. In descending or motor pathway, you have how many sets of neurons? Two. Upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. Now, what is interesting is upper motor neurons work like parrots upper okay and lower motor neurons don't write it in your answer if I ask the question lower motor neurons work like small kids you know when you take your small child to a park, you need to watch them, right? You sit and watch. You can run with them, but you can sit and watch, right? You do that. Because they try to run away sometimes. Don't listen to you. So the lower motor neurons do what? Send strong signal to the muscles and always try to contract the muscle forcefully. Make sense? Hyper, you know hyper, the kids are hyper, right? Okay, we'll do more. So, the lower motor neurons are hyper. Always try to keep the skeletal muscles what? Contracted. And upper motor neurons are always sending signal to the lower motor neurons and telling them, don't contract that forcefully. So, inhibiting the lower motor neurons. Like parents, they don't go too far, come back. So, the upper motor neurons sending inhibitory signals to the lower motor neurons and suppressing them. So, that your muscles, skeletal muscles are not too tight, right? Not too strongly contact. There is muscle tone always, right? But not like very strongly uh, contracted. So, that's the function of upper and lower motor neurons. Now you tell me, if the upper motor neuron lesion occurs, these neurons are destroyed, then these neurons will get the freedom, right? No inhibition coming. So what will happen to the muscles? Remain contracted strongly, right? Spasm. And that is called Spastic paralysis, spastic type type paralysis, where the muscles remain strongly contracted, spasm of the muscle. So the person will not be able to move. Make sense? Because if your muscles don't relax, you won't be able to move. Now, opposite. If the upper motor neurons are intact, but due to spinal cord injury, lower motor neurons in this area have been destroyed. So, what will happen? No contraction will go there, right? No contraction will go. So, the muscles will lose the tone. Will get paralyzed. What kind of paralysis is this one? The muscles are flaccid, loose, no muscle tone is there, no contraction is there, right? So that's the flaccid 
die paralysis. Both are paralysis. Muscles are be able to help in movement. If the muscle tone is lost, no movement. Muscle contraction does not occur, no movement. If the muscles are contracted too strong, the movement will be restricted. Right? You won't be able to move. So, the results will be opposite in upper and lower motor neuron uh, lesion. <coughs> okay, spinal cord trauma. Trauma to the spinal cord occurs um, much more in our country here because of road accidents. The road accident, number of road accidents is very high compared to other countries and uh, <coughs> this is a big issue, spinal cord injury and depends on the location where the injury has occurred, the part of body gets paralyzed, paralyzed. If the injury occurs in this part, very upper part of the spinal cord, in cervical area here, one thing remember, where the injury, the paralysis will occur below that. That's simple, right? Below that. Because above that, that part is connected to the brain. Still connected to the brain. Uh, so, if the injury occurs in this part, upper cervical part, then whole body below that gets paralyzed. That means... All four limbs, right? Upper two limbs, lower two limbs, and the trunk are paralyzed. So that is called what? Quadriplasia. Quadri indicates four, right? All four limbs are paralyzed. Do you remember Superman? Some of you must remember that uh, uh, person, Christopher Reeve, right? Christopher Reeve, he, he got quadriplegia because he got injury here, fell off uh, horse from his horse, broke the neck. So quadriplegia. If the paralysis uh, injury occurs in thoracic area here, then upper two limbs are intact, right? Not affected. The part below that that means the lower part of the body, lower two limbs will be affected with lower part of the trunk. And that is called paraplasia. In paraplasia, upper limbs are functional. Lower two limbs are affected. If one side of the body is paralyzed, that is called hemiplasia. Hemiplasia. So, one side of the spinal cord got injured, uh, so that is affecting one side of the body. So, that is hemiplasia. So, those are three commonly heard uh, conditions, uh, clinical conditions related to the spinal cord injury. Uh, we have already talks, talked about reflex in last class, uh, so you already know that. Beniski's sign, Beniski's sign uh, indicates the person has motor neuron disease. If the Beniski's sign is positive, that indicates the person might have motor disorder or motor neuron disease. This test is called Beninsky's uh, a plantar reflex. The test is called plantar reflex and the sign is called Beninsky's sign. So we do plantar reflex test to see if Beninsky's sign is positive or negative. What is plantar reflex test? Very simple. We 
ask the patient to lie down and you hold the leg like this okay. and then uh, you take something blunt, don't take short things and <laughs> cut the foot. So take something blunt, you can take your pen and other side, not the sharp end, and scratch the sole of the foot. But the way to scratch is you start from the bottom of the big toe. So this is the bottom of the big toe. From there, lateral, uh, you will, no, no, no. I said wrong, opposite. Start, start from the heel and then go along the lateral side like this and go all the way to the <coughs> bottom of the toes and then when you reach the bottom of the toes you start to move towards the big toe like this. So this is how you will scratch and when you do that if you see the toes flexion of the toes and that means the reflex is there flexion of the toes now if you see the extension of the toes when you do the scratch extension of the toes also called fanning or spreading of the toes like this so that indicates the Bravinsky sign is positive okay so normally when you stretch the toes should flex flexion of the toes should occur okay but if you see extension of the toes and also spreading of the toes or fanning of the toes that means uh, the reflex is absent that means reflex is sorry extension occurs that means the reflex is absent sign is present Bravinsky sign is positive so you have to think that reflex is absent Reflex is what? This is reflex, right? So if you see that does not occur happening this, that means what? Reflex is not present. But what is present? Sign is present, right? So that indicates there could be a modern event disorder. But don't try this uh, in a small, very small kids, infants, like one to two year. If you do that, you will see their Bensky sign is positive. And that is normal for them. Why? Because your moral control develops slowly in first couple of years. It takes first couple of years to develop your moral control, right? And you know, infants don't have moral control. How you know that? They don't work. To work, you need moral control. To maintain the balance, you need moral control, right? To Hold the reflex, urination or defecation, you need motor reflex, right? So, those are absent in infants. That means their motor neurons are not yet developed. So, that's why you see the Bensky sign positive in them. Don't take them to the house, doctor, okay? If you do that. So, so I'm not sure if you're using the sign upper motor or lower motor? Upper motor neuron disorder. Okay. Because the upper motor neuron controls those things. Did you get it? Everything? 